Hello friends, my name is Host Eric. And I am the now louder host of Talking With Famous People. And I want to begin tonight's discussion with worldviews. Paradigms that you associate with yourself as part of your identity. So I got a comment earlier today that I thought was interesting from Zachary. And it said, um, he d d defined himself as a traditionalist and said that he came talking with famous people, a disillusioned liberal, and sort of found his way into his worldview in some sort of Hegelian middle ground, or I don't know, or whatever he found. The point is of this video is not to proclaim any one worldview superior to another, but rather to dissect the notion of having a worldview. So when people say a worldview, they're referring to a composite made up of several different things. Uh, frameworks, frameworks that apply to oneself, frameworks that apply to others, frameworks that apply to groups, which are basically, for in terms of, from a behavioral perspective, they represent ways in which others might predict how you're likely to respond to a given idea, sentence, statement, position, whatever. And they predict what kind of justifications you're going to use for a given uh, prescriptive action. So Two people of different worldviews might ascribe to the same course of action for entirely different reasons and have it mean different things to them in their identity. <laughs> so one of the most important things we need to do to get a meaningful understanding of worldview or paradigm is to differentiate between different kinds of positions. If one has a Christian worldview, one is saying, I frame everything through, every, most things through this framework. That when I'm thinking about questions related to myself or others that I find troubling or difficult or whatever, that in those circumstances I'm going to use this common reference point of Christianity and it will provide the principles and other things and other pieces of language that I use as reference to make my statements more meaningful than the same statements would be reference free is it possible to have statements that are reference free? Well, no, but it's possible to have statements that are framework free, more or less. And, but those things are not prescriptive ever, they're descriptive. So, that's not really what, what we're talking about usually. So when Zachary says he's got a traditionalist worldview, what he means is, in his head, he has a clear understanding of what my worldview is, or he thinks he does, and he positions himself, his own worldview, in contrast to that. And when I read that, I realized, and I've been thinking about it sort of in between sleeping since, I realized people don't, don't understand what my, my actual position is at all. If Zachary doesn't understand it, nobody does. My position is that 
well-defended justifications are stronger than poorly defended justifications. <laughs> oh, they're around the back. You gotta go out back to get those. They're on the grill. I grilled them myself. So, I think there's a mistake that probably almost everybody would make to say that I'm libertarian or anarcho-capitalist or something like that or some other label that I might have used on myself even at times as a shorthand. But my position is not that we ought to do radical actions in the face of bad utilitarian consequences. Ever. My position is, if and when we need to violate principle, we agree upon is at least in an ideal world what we ought to ascribe to, and it boils down to non-transgression, then let's take that seriously when making our utilitarian compromises. Let's begin thinking about government as something that adheres to a limiting principle as a way of proving its own legitimacy. Let's start thinking about government as actual citizen democracy. If we were thinking about it as an actual citizen democracy, we'd wonder why we we punish ourselves so severely for rules violations that don't the, the violation of the rule causes way less harm than the enforcement of the rule. We, we'd wonder about that. Why are we doing this to ourselves? Why am I giving myself this ticket? Why am I giving my neighbor this ticket? If it's a citizen democracy, we're thinking of it like that. Now, I tend to attack statist positions. And I do so because I believe, by and large, they're defended with lies. I am not opposed to statist policies necessarily that are justified with the correct kind of justifications. Whatever the, the policy is that we're advocating for, my number one belief is that we have to be willing to acknowledge the real, the reality of the thing that we're advocating for. And to understand, to say, look, I'm going to now advocate for something that includes rights violations. And that means I'm advocating in favor of aggression. But it's justified in this circumstance by utilitarian claims. Okay, fine. But make sure you're ready to to show that that those utilitarian claims are real, that those harms are real, that those benefits are real, that you've factored in all the impacts. Right now we are playing fast and loose with our policy relating to principle. We don't consider it at all. When we pass laws now that do massive harms and achieve little benefit, we fail to do an impact calculus. We fail to do an impact calculus. I'm not a doomsday prophet at all. I'm not I am not saying the world's going to spiral into disaster. I'm not claiming we're going to have massive harms going forward. I'm saying the status quo sucks ass. It's not acceptable. It can certainly be better. Nobody disputes me on that. So, yeah, I'm not making any doomsday predictions at all. I'm not saying we have to change or we're going to uh, end up in a, in a one world government with black helicopters flying around. Not one goddamn bit of that from me. What I'm telling you is that in the status quo, we citizens are not behaving as though this is our government. We're not behaving that way. We're doing things to ourselves that I don't understand why we would do those. Well, mostly, in large part, it's because we don't think of ourselves as the government. We think of the government as them and us as us. That's a problem. Now, someone might say, well, Eric, you're not even giving any meaningful policy prescriptions then. You're just saying, 
He's saying, well, we need to change our frame of reference and look at these policy prescriptions through. Well, the, the fact is we can't, I could go through every possible policy decision and say this is what I would be likely to do in this context or that context and yada, yada, yada. But there is contextual matters to be concerned with. So I, it's impossible to say exactly what you're going to do. All you can do is give your best direction as far as how the frame that you're going to view things through the level of accountability you're going to demand before any, any sort of legal transgression is authorized and encouraged. And I'm going to look for ways in which rights violations can be minimized and harms of existing rights violations can be minimized. Like I, so I say, the first thing I would do if I, when I become president is um, I'm going to pardon all the drug offenders. It's the, only, it's the right thing to do. The fact that that's not currently happening is it's obscene have seen you got people who are in cages even though they hurt nobody and people with the power to, to let them out are choosing not to it's obscene those individuals who are choosing not to need to be ashamed of themselves What if that would lead to more crime because of the culture we kept them in? Well, I mean, when we do harms to prevent crime, we commit a crime. So, it's possible that pardoning a bunch of drug offenders will cause a spike in crime, but if they were criminals, then they should have been in jail in the first place for real crimes. Now, if being in jail made them into criminals, well, you know, I mean, the thing is, we have no choice but to let them out and give them a chance to actually commit a real crime before we reincarcerate them. They haven't committed one yet. They've been incarcerated. Let's let them out. You're going to tell me, let those, don't let those innocent people out because... They might have learned to be criminals in jail. Or what if they were actually factually innocent of a different of a real crime? Would you want to let them out then? Well, they might have learned to be criminals. If they're factually innocent and they're in jail for a crime they didn't commit. Well, in this case, they're not factually innocent. They did the thing that they're accused of, but it's not a crime. So, what is a crime is locking them in a cage for it. That's a crime. That's a transgression. Because... There's no justification for it. So, I mean, certain things are pretty cut and dry, right? I'm not trying to dodge taking policy stances at all. <laughs> but I am telling you that the notion of having a clear worldview that lets you know what you think ought to be done is, a, is, a, is an illusion. What you have are sets of frameworks that allow you to narrow the scope of choices in any given circumstance to those that are most morally acceptable within your frameworks, within your sets of frameworks and your meta framework. So the other thing I'd say about a worldview is if you are under 30, you are not done with your worldview yet. To the extent that you're going to end up ever being done with it, you're not done with it yet. and the reason you're not done with it is because you're not giving future you any credit. You have a lot of years ahead of you and you're not giving future you any credit. And finally, I'm not looking for converts. I don't have a position or a team you can join. I'm not a libertarian. Certainly not a Republican or a Democrat, not a liberal, not a conservative. I'm a means-driven, process-driven, scrutiny-driven worldview. It's not about any specific conclusion, but about how you reached it. Now, you might say, well, that's ridiculous, Eric. You're, you're going to side with libertarianism all the time or something like that. Not necessarily. 
again, these things are contextually dependent. So I understand that as president, I'm going to have to make compromises. But you know where I'm going to compromise from. A principled position of protecting the individual from transgression against them by those who have the guns, right? Remember, there's two populations. Those who have the guns and are willing to use them, and those who either don't have the guns or aren't willing to use them. My position is those who have the guns and are willing to use them need to be defending the right principles and need to be held to strict accountability for use of force. That the laws that enable the people of this nation to use force against one another, that enable some citizens to use force against other for citizens, that those laws need to be scrutinized, that they need to be tested for soundness, that we need to be honest in our impact calculi. I'm saying all of those things. And that's my worldview. It's kind of hard to disagree with without saying I'd like things to be less well tested. Thanks for watching Talking with Famous People.